I think we might get started um, because I'm really excited about today's presentations in the last seminar for the year from LITS. And the overall theme of what we're going to be um, thinking about and talking about today is engaging people with neurological disability, acquired neurological disability in, in most cases. Um, and we're focusing on two aspects of that work, quality support and co-design. And with us today presenting, we have Megan Topping and Kate DeCruz, both of whom are important researchers within our partnership, um, Lids partnership with the Summer Foundation. Lids has had that, have had that partnership now for quite a long time, since about 2014. So we've developed a strong research alliance and we do a lot of research together all the way through from doctoral candidates to research assistants who work um, from the La Trobe context with Summer Foundation through to senior research fellows and myself. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker this afternoon. Before I do that, though, quickly to remind you that when you have questions or queries, please put them into the Q&A and we'll actually go through those questions and queries um, at the end of each presenter's presentation. So let's start. And I'd like to begin by introducing Megan Toppy. Megan is a doctoral researcher at the Summer Foundation and La Trobe University. I'm enrolled here at La Trobe. And Megan is actually getting very close to the end point of her PhD work, which has been a really exciting set of studies. And she'll talk to you about that today. The title of her presentation today is you're supporting the whole person and Megan's going to work with us through a model of quality support grounded in the experience of adults with neurological disability, disability support workers and close others. So bringing together those three perspectives. Welcome Megan, it's lovely to have you here today and take it away. Thank you, Jacinta. Um, yeah, hi everyone. Thanks for being here today. Um, so as Jacinta said, I'll be presenting an overview of my whole PhD project, which is building a model of quality support that is grounded in the lived experience of adults with acquired neurological disability, support workers and close others. And I do just want to start today by acknowledging and thanking my supervisors who are Jacinta Douglas and I Winkler. So I'll start today by talking through why this research is important and how we got to this research question. I'll then give an overview of the whole PhD project and go through my methods. I'll then talk through the quality of support from the three perspectives. So we built three separate models and then I'll bring them together at the end. And then I'll finish up by talking through some limitations and then next steps and implications of the research. So why is this research important? So as most people here will know, Australia is signed on to the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, which states that people have the right to, or should have the right to choose where and with whom they live. And for a lot of people with disability, they therefore require an access to a range of disability supports to ensure that they have the support they need to live where and with whom they would like and have full inclusion in the community. We also then have the NDIS, which in theory promises to promote the provision of high quality and innovative supports to maximise people's lifestyles and again, their full inclusion in the community. So in theory, the NDIS means more choice and control for people with disability, and it also promotes a more person-centred approach to support. However, there's still limited guidance for people with disability who are navigating these support systems and trying to build these quality teams. There's also limited insights data from the perspective of people with disability about what people really want from their support workers and what they value in support. 
And finally, there's arguably more demands on the disability support workforce under individualized funding schemes because their role is to be responsive to the needs of a widely varying population. So in order to really fulfill these aims and provide quality support, we need to first understand what it is that people value in quality support. So my research aimed to build a holistic understanding of the factors that influence the quality of paid disability support that's grounded in the lived experience of people with acquired neurological disability, disability support workers, and also close others. So thinking of family and partners of people with acquired disability. To answer this research question, I started with a scoping review of the peer reviewed literature. Um, and I won't go through those findings today, but that was really asking, what do we already know? What's already out there? Um, and those findings are published and available open access if you're interested. I then conducted three independent interview studies where I interviewed people with disability, support workers and close others about what they think influences the quality of support. And I'm now bringing those three perspectives together to develop this holistic model that's grounded in people's lived experience. And finally, we want to translate these findings into practice and really inform policy and practice and help to improve the quality of support. So today I'll be focusing on those three interview studies and building those models of quality support. So as I've said, the primary research method here was an interview study. So I used one-to-one -one semi-structured in-depth interviews where I asked people about their experiences of support, what they think makes an excellent support worker, if there's other factors that they feel influences the quality of support, and if they've experienced any barriers to receiving quality support. Now, we aim to start these interviews in about April 2020, so I'm sure you can all guess why we couldn't do that face to face. Um, so we had to transition to remote interviewing, so interviewing by a telephone or video conference. And as this was quite new territory, we conducted a rapid narrative review of the literature um, to find out what considerations we needed to make in this transition to online. And that paper is published and available open access. So if you're conducting interviews online, it might be useful. This is a constructivist grounded theory study, which is a qualitative methodology whereby all the findings are really grounded in the data. So we're not coming with any preconceived ideas and we're not coming with any preset coding. So to analyze the data, you follow a three-stage um, coding technique. And as I mentioned, I analyzed all three perspectives independently. So they were treated as three independent studies. And you use constant comparison method, whereby you're constantly, as you're coding, you're going back to the data and comparing data within codes and between participants to develop those themes and sub-themes, which we use then to eventually build this model of quality support. And as I go through the findings today, I will use quotes, but all names are replaced with pseudonyms to protect the participants' identities. And if you'd like to know more, again, about the kind of practical and how we did this um, research, I um, published a methods case study as well about kind of that transition to online interviewing. So who are our research participants? So I interviewed 12 adults with acquired neurological disability with a mean age of 46, four of whom were male, seven were female, and one was agender. Five participants had multiple sclerosis, five had an acquired brain injury, one had a spinal cord injury, and one had another neurological disorder. Most participants were living in their own home or a private rental, and three participants lived in shared supported accommodation, and one participant was living in residential aged care, but all participants were receiving one-to-one -one paid disability support. And this support was provided via a service provider that they had selected themselves, or via their housing provider, and some participants used direct employment, so via online platforms, um, and some used a mix of both. You'll notice that doesn't add up to 12. And on average, participants were receiving 103 hours of paid support a week. I then interviewed 12 disability support workers who had a mean age of 33, and four were male and eight were female. And their year's experience as a support worker ranged from six months right up to 12 years. 
And seven of these participants were working via online platforms and nine via traditional service providers and four used a mix of both. And seven worked in people's private homes or the community and six were working in shared supported accommodation and one person did both. Um, but again, all were providing one-to-one -one support. And finally, I interviewed 10 close others with a mean age of 64, and one was male, nine were female. Um, eight of these participants were parents of people with disability, and two were spouses. And their close others, nine had an acquired brain injury, and one had cerebral palsy, and they were receiving 117 hours on average a week of paid support. So I'll start by going through the findings from the perspective of people with disability. So we learned that the key factors influencing the quality of support were situated in the dyadic space between the person with disability and the support worker. So this is that place in practice where the two are working together. We then learned that broader contextual factors can influence the realization of quality support in that dyadic space by means of facilitating or hindering the person's authentic choice. And finally, we learned that when people with disability receive quality support, they're better able to feel in control. So I'll start by going through those factors in that dyadic space. And these factors were developed such that there was what you as the support worker need to do, remembering that this is coming from the person with disabilities perspective, then what I as the person with disability need to do, and what we need to do together to facilitate quality support. Firstly, under what you need to do is recognize me as an individual. And this emerged as an overarching factor such that support workers need to do this first and foremost before any of the other factors can be realized. So here participants talked about coming without any assumptions, don't make assumptions on my disability type, really understand that I'm an individual with my own needs and preferences. So as Georgie, one of our participants said, everybody's different to each other. And that's what it comes down to. Like you've got to figure out what it is that that individual needs. So this is your starting point of delivering good support. Next, you need to want to support me. So as Isabella says, I want someone that wants to actually be a carer as their job. So coming with the right motivations, not just doing this job to fill employment, um, just really that you actually want to be a support worker. Because as Sarah says, I don't want to hear that I'm a burden. We didn't ask for this disability to so show that you're interested and want to be there. Next, people wanted to be treated as a person. So here people talked a lot about dignity and respect. So Charlie here is reflecting upon a time when he didn't receive quality support and he says, they didn't know your name, treat you like you're just a body in a bed. Whereas now receiving quality support, he says, here they treat you like a person. They ask you what you want. Next, people really wanted to be seen as the expert. So here we mean the expert in their own needs and preferences. So they wanted support workers who were willing to listen and learn from them and follow their instructions. As Lauren says, I'm the boss and I want things done my way. It's my life and you're here to help me. And Alex similarly says, if I say something's important, just trust me that it's important, respect my perspective. And finally, you need to respond to my needs. So within this, there was the need to look out for what my needs are. So be attentive, pay attention, know me well enough to pick up on those needs, which is what Kelly's talking about here when she says, I've got a variable condition that changes from day to day. So they need to pick up on the job. So here she's saying whether or not she's strong enough. And for other people, this might be whatever their needs are. And there was also an element of being competent to respond to those needs as part of this theme as well. Now moving to what I need to do. So people talked about, they want the opportunity to lead their supports. And this really mirrors that factor about seeing me as the expert. So you need to see me as the expert and I need the opportunity to be in the driving seat. So as Isabella says, I want to be the one calling all the shots. It's my life, why the hell would anyone else call the shots? Because as Alex says, it's horrible when people are trying to run your life for you. So I will acknowledge that, of course, my participants were able to tell me what they wanted and in that 
and such able to tell their support workers. So leading supports may look different for different people, um, but the principle of really ensuring that you're providing that support in line with their needs and preferences still remains. Now moving to the we need to. So first of all, we need to be the right fit. So here participants were talking about being compatible with their support workers in some way. And for some participants like Tony, this was quite a concrete concept. So having similar interests or being of a similar age or the same gender. So Tony wants someone who enjoys the things that he does, like going to the footy. Whereas for other participants like Sarah, it was a more abstract concept around connecting with someone or gelling, just generally getting along well. So Sarah said, I really don't care what qualifications she's got. I care about how we gelled. Next, we need to work well together. So here participants talked about the reciprocity in the relationship, the give and take, and how we need mutual respect. We need to communicate effectively with one another and be patient with one another. So Ashley here is talking about advice that he would, or what he would say to a new support worker. And he says, we're both new at this. Let's be patient. And if I do anything that you don't like, please let me know. And I would like to do the same. So it's a two-way street. We've got to work together. So thinking about this in terms of a model of quality support, we have what you need to do and what I need to do. And these are interrelated such that when you do what you need to do, I'm better positioned to lead my support. So if you're seeing me as an expert, treating me as a person, and when I'm leading my supports, you're better able to fulfill your role. So you're better able to see me as the expert and to respond to my needs as I want them to be responded to. And then on the other side, we have what we need to do. And again, this relates to what I need to do in that kind of circular way, because Again, if I'm leading my supports, that means I've likely been able to choose who my support workers are. And in turn, we're more likely to be the right fit. And if we're working well together, I'm in turn more comfortable to lead my supports. So finally, in this dyadic space, we have this underarching factor of getting the balance right. So here participants really acknowledge the complexity of the relationship because, and as Ashley says, it can be hard not to make a relationship out of it. And this is because often people spend a long time with their support workers Sorry. over a long period of time. Sorry. Um, so it can mean that you there's that personal element, but you've also got to remain professional. So you need to get that balance of the working versus the personal. And this balance might look different for different participants. So for Kelly, she makes she wants boundaries to be fluid and flexible. Whereas Paula says it's always good to keep that sort of line in there. So it may differ, but it's important that you work well together to get this balance right. And that will facilitate those factors in the dyadic space. So zooming out, this is our dyadic space model from the person with disabilities perspective. Moving beyond that dyadic space, um, participants acknowledge some broader contextual factors that influence the realization of these factors in the dyadic space. The first of which being the support arrangements. So where and from whom you receive support really impacts whether people felt they had choice over their workers and how much autonomy they had in their day. So thinking about whether that's in shared supported accommodation, in your home, through a service provider, through direct employment. And they felt that whether they have choice and autonomy over their day really impacts that support in the dyadic space. Next, people referenced how the system influences the support they receive. So people here talked about how now with the NDIS, they feel they have more choice and they're able to build the teams that they want to build. And finally, they referenced the broader society. So here people talked about how broader societal attitudes and values can really trickle down into individual support workers or support providers and then impact how their role is seen and then in turn how they treat the person with disability in practice. So you may have noticed a common thread here in that the broader contextual factors from the person with disabilities perspective really influence the dyadic space because they influenced how much choice that person had and in turn this is what influences the quality of support. 
And then on the other side of the dietic space, we learned that when people receive quality support, they're better able to feel in control. So Ashley here is talking about his favorite support worker. And he says, we don't need to fight over decisions. He's happy to just let me be myself and give decisions about where I want to go and how long for. He's very, very easy. And I feel this captures it really beautifully because this is how support should feel. It should feel easy. You should be able to be yourself and you should feel in control. So this is our model of support from people with disabilities. So we have those key factors in that dyadic space. We have how the broader context influences by means of influencing someone's authentic choice. And then we have this almost product of receiving quality support is that I feel in control. So now moving to the support worker perspective. So the factors that influence the quality of support were again situated in that dyadic space and really echoed the person with disabilities perspective. So I'm not gonna go through all those factors again because whilst the themes were named slightly differently, the principles of recognizing that individual, seeing them as the expert working well together were all the same from the support worker perspective. Support workers then talked about some additional factors related to coming with the right skills and attributes, which we named under a theme of being the right person for the role. Support workers then also acknowledged how they themselves can work to maintain and improve that quality of support. And finally, they acknowledged the broader context within which support is provided. So starting with being the right person for the role, support workers felt that you need to come with the capacity to connect. So really wanting to work with people, being open to building those connections and relationships and having a sense of empathy. So Frankie, one of our support workers says, I think that being a people person helps very much. I love working with just talking to different people. Next, support workers again acknowledge that you really need to want to do the role. So the same as what people with disability said, you need to have the right motivations. So as Danny says, if they don't enjoy the work they do, then they shouldn't be doing it. It's not just a job, it's a very personal field. And finally, support workers acknowledge the importance or the influence of your prior experience. So this could be industry experience or lived experience and how that they felt that you really learn best kind of on the job or on in similar experiences. So Rory said, I feel that no training in a classroom can trump the experiences handed down from experienced staff. And Joyce acknowledges that a lived experience is best. Go and volunteer somewhere. It's really learning on the job. Now moving to how support workers felt they need to maintain and improve the quality of support. So first of all, they felt that you need to engage in reflective practice. So really ask yourself, as Danny here says, am I doing the best I can? Am I doing it in the best way as the clients requested? So doing this in an ongoing way and being accountable and learning from your mistake, mistakes. And they acknowledge that you can do this by kind of informal conversation with the person you're supporting. So they felt it's really important to get that feedback from the person you're providing support to. Next, they felt you need to be willing to learn and develop your skills in an ongoing way. So different people with disability will require you to have different skills and competencies, and even the same people, their needs change over time. So you need to always be willing to further your knowledge and your experience, as Frankie here says. And finally, they talked about how um, you need to look after yourself. So support workers said that the role can sometimes be quite emotionally taxing. So as Courtney here says, you need to make sure you look after yourself as well, because the way you're going to be able to perform best is to make sure you're getting everything you need. So from the support workers, they feel that you need to come with those right skills and attributes and motivations. And this facilitates quality support in that dyadic space. So it allows you to better recognize that person, to see them as the expert, work well together. And then they acknowledged how the individual support worker needs to really be reflective, develop their skills and look after themselves. And finally, they talked about the broader context and how 
that impacts how well you can do those things. And I'm not going to go through the support workers perspective on the broader context in detail um, because close others add more to that. So I will go through that from the close other perspective. So moving to the close other perspective. Um, so first of all, again, amazingly, the factors in the dyadic space really echoed that person with disabilities perspective. So again, they were named slightly differently, um, but the principles of recognizing that person as an individual, seeing them as an expert, respecting their autonomy, and that the person with disability and support worker need to work well together were really echoed in the close other interviews. Um, so again, I won't go through those because I will be mainly repeating myself. Um, and they also endorse the support worker perspective around a lot of the factors. So um, Close Others talked about the importance of the support worker maintaining accountability. And within this, they discussed how support workers need to really want to do the role. They talked about being prepared for the role and also um, engaging in reflective practice. So how this is kind of important from start to finish in that support experience. And finally, they talked about, so there was some novel factors introduced around the team level. So Close Others talked about the role of building a good support team and how that fosters quality support at that dyadic level. And finally, they talked about the broader context in terms of that we need to develop the support workforce. And I'll go through that in depth as well. So I'll just go through those novel factors introduced from Close Others. So firstly, the working as a team. So Close Others felt that you really need to build an effective support team. And noting here that these were Close Others of people with quite complex support needs. So all of them had more than one support worker. They all had a team of support workers. So Close Others talked about strategies to kind of make this most effective. Um, one of which Shannon talks to here where she says, the idea is that everybody can do everything here. It's got to be all inclusive. So making sure that all of your support workers are competent to cover any of your shifts, and this makes things go a lot more seamlessly. They also talked about some mechanisms for team communication, especially when the person with disability isn't able to relay that information. And they also talked about appointing a key worker who can oversee the team um, and that takes some of that oversight off the close other in this case or people with disability as well. Next, close others talked about the value of providing personalized training to your support team. So in line with recognizing that person as an individual, that person has individual needs, individual ways they want to be supported. So they talked about the kind of time demand of doing this. And Chris here says, there's a huge amount of training that's needed for Jackie, who's close other. It takes him months to get to know someone and for someone to get to know him and all the little nuances of his care. So Close Others really talked about how you want to make sure support workers are comfortable um, and there's a lot of training that is often required for that. And they gave examples of how they deliver this training or how their Close Other with Disability delivers the training. So they talked about using shadow shifts or written guidelines. Some participants used video resources and some had their key worker facilitate this training as well. And finally here, Close Others talked about the importance of the service provider, if they had one, um, being engaged and responsive. So really what Close Others talked about wanting from a service provider echoed what participants wanted from support workers. So they wanted a provider who prioritizes the person with disability, who gets to know that person well, listens to them, develops that relationship. So Chris here says, it's not just a faceless person sitting at a desk allocating staff. I think it's really important to have an agency where they become very involved and hands-on. So they wanted providers to know that person so that they could reliably match appropriate staff with them, so appropriate support workers. Um, and they also wanted them to know their support workers well and look after their support workers and ensure that they're competent to do the role. So moving on to the workforce level, so that kind of broader context, Close Others talked about how we need to increase and retain quality workers. So they acknowledge the variable quality in the workforce 
and felt that because of this variable quality, their role in supporting their close other to coordinate their support team was much greater. So they felt there was low availability of workers in certain demographics or skill sets. So Ali here says, the males are much harder to get. To get people at that age with the mentality you want and the character and stuff like that is a bit tricky too. They also felt that the need for workforce growth that we're seeing with the NDIS meant that they felt some service providers were almost less selective or less choosy. Um, and they also acknowledged the difficulties of retaining workers and said that turnover is really disruptive for their close other with disability because they then don't know that person or they've lost that relationship. Um, and there's also more of a burden on hiring and training new workers as well. So on the back of this, they talked about the need to improve support workers' working conditions to better attract and retain and foster quality workers. So they talked about giving workers security in their roles so they don't leave for other sectors. They felt that sometimes pay rates were inconsistent or misaligned with their responsibilities when they were providing more complex supports. Um, so they tried to find ways to kind of improve the working conditions themselves. And Sammy here felt that appointing that key worker really helped. So she said the key worker makes sure that those needs are met, which makes them better employees because they've got job satisfaction and job security and someone to turn to. And finally, they talked about the accountability in the sector. So close others kind of deemed the disability sector to have lower standards than other human service industries. And they felt therefore that the sector needs to be more accountable for service quality. They gave examples like um, service providers sending incompetent or um, staff who were unprepared and felt there was kind of minimal consequences despite the kind of risk that put to their close other with disability. They also didn't trust agencies to reliably provide backup staff. And this cultivated quite a lot of stress and anxiety in close others where they worried about what would happen when they could no longer fulfill that role as backup or for other people who didn't have someone to fulfill that role. As Sammy talks about here when she says, I do wonder how people that have a disability that don't have an advocate, how they have quality support workers, how they have consistent support, how they just survive. So it was a real source of worry for people. So bringing the close other model together, we have that team level where if we build that effective support team, um, that influences support at that dyadic level. And then support workers need to maintain accountability. And finally, we need to develop the workforce to have that trickle down effect so that we have quality work workers to build that team with. So to bring these three perspectives together. So as I've talked about, all three perspectives acknowledge the importance of the dyadic space in influencing quality support and that the support worker needs to recognize that person as an individual, see them as the expert and the dyad really need to work well together. We then had some facilitators from each of the perspectives. So people with disability talked about having authentic choice and how this better makes the support better in that dyadic space. Support workers talked about coming to the role with the right skills, motivations, attitudes, and close others talked about that team level. So if you have a team of good support workers, this facilitates quality support as well. And then both close others and support workers acknowledge the support workers role in being accountable and maintaining and improving the quality of support. And people with disability are better able to feel in control when they receive quality support. And then thinking about that broader context, we had that the close others talked about how we need to develop the support workforce more broadly. And then both the people with disability and support workers acknowledged how the broader context can influence the realization of these other factors as well. So that is a run through the whole model from the three perspectives. So I'll now just finish by going through some limitations. So with any studies like this where participants are volunteering to participate, there's going to be some kind of sampling bias. So here we had people with disability, as I mentioned, who were able to and really wanted to share their experiences. 
Um, so of course there will be different kind of ways to lead your supports and things if you aren't able to do so directly. Um, but we did speak to close others who their close others with disability had quite complex needs and they need a lot of support to do that. So we did get some insights there. We also, by nature, the support workers we interviewed were very motivated and engaged. So although it was amazing that their um, view really overlapped with the perspective of people with disability, we can't say that this is the view of the whole population of support workers. Um, but we didn't feel that was too problematic for this study where we were trying to find out the kind of best quality support. Most of our participants were living in metropolitan areas. So um, we do know that there are different availability and access needs, of course, in rural and regional areas. So again, different issues might crop up if we spoke to more participants in those areas. And this research is specific to the Australian system as of course, all participants were living in Australia. And finally, we didn't interview any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people. And I feel we'd need to do a separate study because we know in different cultural groups, there's different needs and preferences again. So we don't want to generalize to that group either. So thinking about next steps, um, I'd like to do a co-design project to work with people with disability, close others, support workers, and also providers to really go to the next step. So we now have this theoretical understanding, um, but we'd love to translate these findings into practical solutions that are driven by the people that will use them and need them. There are lots of other research avenues and questions that come out of this research. So I feel this would be a great start to develop a quality of support measure with some of these as kind of the starting dimensions. So this could be a measure for people with disability to evaluate their workers and also for support workers to kind of do self-appraisal and engage in that reflective practice. And of course, as I mentioned, we'd want to do this study with different cultural groups, disability types, and also more rural and regional participants. And finally, look at the interface between quality support and those dyadic factors with other issues that may impact on that dyadic space. So things like thinking about dignity of risk or risk enablement, um, the power imbalances between people with disability and their support workers, and also that family involvement as well. So to finish on some key takeaways, so the delivery of quality support in that dyadic space really echoed the human rights framework that I started with and those NDIS principles of choice and control. We really need to support people with disability to make authentic choices. So whilst it's great to say people have choice in theory, we, to make that authentic, we need to make sure that people are informed and supported to make those choices. So this might look like resources for building, managing and training quality support teams. And finally, we need to develop and retain the quality workforce. So this might look like having a broader understanding of what the role is to attract that varied and diverse workforce that we need to meet the needs of a diverse group of people with disability. We also need better screening for attitudes and motivations rather than a one size fits all training because I feel this research really shows us the importance of individualized support and people with disability having that choice. Um, and the things that are important are the support workers attitudes and motivations, being willing to learn seeing that person as the expert. And finally, there's those things around raising accountability in the sector and also recognizing the value of quality support and how important it is for the lives of people with disability. So thank you so much. Um, I just wanna finish by acknowledging and thanking my research participants. And also the papers from this study are all published and available open access if you are interested to learn more. Thanks so much. Thank you, Megan, um, for a, a lovely guided tour through a lot of really interesting information. Um, get started on, as I say, the second half of our session this afternoon. And I'd like to introduce our audience to Dr. Kate De Cruz. Kate is a Senior Research Fellow and Research Team Manager at the Summer Foundation. Kate did her PhD at La Trobe and Kate is an adjunct 
um, staff member lecturer at, at, the, at La Trobe University too, and has worked, had worked at La Trobe for quite a few years in the occupational therapy department. So it's been a joy to actually work together again at the Summer Foundation, as well as at La Trobe. So this afternoon, as I said, Kate is going to talk about strengthening opportunities for people with neurological disability to live independently and talk to us about, give us information about a really interesting co-design project that Kate led um, and that I think has produced lots of interesting findings. So welcome, Kate, and you can take it away. Lovely. Thank you so much, Jacinta. And thank you to Leeds for the opportunity to talk with you today about this co-design project. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we um, gather today. For me, that's the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I expect, extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. I'd also like to acknowledge the many people who were involved in this co-design project, um, and in particular, I'd like to acknowledge the co-authors or contributing authors to this work. So Monique de Costa, Jacinta Douglas, and Di Winkler. And it's delightful to present actually this afternoon um, after such a beautiful presentation from Megan. So, so here we go. So we know that there are currently just under 3,000 people aged under 65 years living in residential aged care. Despite a shift towards individualised models of housing for people with disability, funding opportunities and government UPRAP targets, this number is still too high. So in designing this project, we recognise the importance of capacity building individuals and families to imagine the possibility of moving out of residential aged care. And we very much saw this as a perfect opportunity um, for co-designing with people who have the lived experience of moving out of aged care to share this wisdom and experience as part of the capacity building. So with that in mind, the, the aim of this project was to co-design and create tools to build the capacity of young people with disability to take action to move out of residential aged care. And by using a co-design approach, we really hoped to demonstrate successful housing outcomes, to meet the information needs of people with disability currently residing in aged care, to build the capacity of people with disability in aged care, to be empowered to make an informed choice about independent living options, and to increase leadership and influencing opportunities for the co-design participants themselves, so those with the lived experience of having moved out of residential aged care. This co-design project was conducted over a period of 12 months and had three distinct phases, as you can see on the slide here. And I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about each of those phases, because as we're growing our understanding, of what co-design is or what it can be. I think it's really important that we do talk about what we're actually doing in the co-design as a group of participants. So in phase one, this involved um, the recruitment. So we recruited 10 adults with neurological disability, and this included people with acquired brain injury, muscular dystrophy, multiple sclerosis and stroke. And each of these adults really had significant um, cognitive and communication difficulties um, and had a lot of experience um, in navigating um, the, the world. We advertised these roles for the co-design project um, in mainstream advertising and we engaged in a process of interviewing for the jobs. And while this was a really great opportunity because we had people make comments to, oh, wow, look at this job advertisement, this is me, I could do this. So there was something really lovely about the opportunity to advertise these positions and to engage in job interviewing. We were also really mindful that for a number of people, this was their first job interview either ever or following their um, injury or acquiring their disability. And so it was really important that those interviews were strengths-based and capacity building in themselves. So we went into those interviews very clearly with that intent. 
um, and consistent with that, we um, were really mindful of then offering positions to all those who um, interviewed for the roles. And we could do that because we were able to tailor the roles to the skills and strengths of those applicants so that we actually then brought together a group of people with a range of skills and interest and availability um, to participate in this project. So recruitment was in fact a phase upon itself and it took a lot of planning and implementation, but it was a really important part of this project. The second phase was the designing of the tools. And of course, this was part of a co-design project. So this designing all happened in partnership across the group participants. And we factored or planned this out into a series of activities. So there was activity one, which was that initial building rapport, understanding the parameters of the project and getting to know each other. And we based this very much around what the Summer Foundation does well, which is sharing lived experience stories. We then moved into a second round of activities was about understanding the problem that we are trying to solve. So recognizing this challenge, this issue of young people with disability being forced to live in nursing homes or residential aged care, or not feeling that they have the resources and the support to move out of residential aged care. So through the, the shared wisdom of the group, we together worked out and explored what this problem was and what is it that we're trying to solve or how can we attempt to solve this problem what can we bring to the issue? The third activity was about defining this problem and then the scope of the tools so that we knew that we wanted to develop some capacity building tools. We had to then explore, well, what, what is that problem, which we looked at in the second activity, and then what are the tools that might address that problem and tools that we felt as a group that we had the, the, the knowledge and the skills um, and I guess the interest in them developing. So then there was a series of brainstorming activities around brainstorming ideas and the content for these tools. Um, and then a process of confirming that content and delegating roles for the next phase. And it's important to note that all of these activities happened um, similar to Megan's PhD study online because it was during COVID. Um, and so we operated in a series of small groups and larger groups, depending upon the needs of the participants. So we had some people who use communication difficult, uh, devices or had communication difficulties. Um, and so we made sure that we just had the right number of participants at different stages of the project so that everybody felt comfortable and capable to share um, and to participate in that brainstorming. And in many ways, actually working online was really accessible for the group participants. Um, it was really great to be able to use different ways of communicating and sharing resources and information. Um, and so in reflection, this was actually a really useful approach for the project. We then moved into the third phase, which was the development of the tools. And again, this was a co-design project. So this was in partnership together um, with the groups. So we had, um, three different groups that were each working on their particular tool that they were developing. So we broke off at this stage into the smaller groups. Um, and this was a process of developing the tools, reviewing the tools as a team and editing those tools, and then finalizing the tools. And this actually included some sharing across the group to get feedback from others who weren't involved in the development around, you know, is this working? Are we kind of capturing this information well? Um, so we, it was a series of smaller and larger workshops, again, depending upon um, each of the tools. And as I said before, this whole process occurred over a 12 month period. So there were some activities that happened in, in, a, in a tight cluster, and then there was a bit of time in between um, in terms of developing the tools. But essentially the whole project from design to producing the tools happened over a 12 month period. And I'm really pleased to share that as the outcomes of this project, 10 capacity building tools were created, and these are currently available on the Housing Hub website. Um, and I'm going to, to talk you through a little bit about these tools now, but I would encourage you, if you have time, to have a look and a bit of an explore of those tools. Um, and certainly we are really keen for people to think about how they might be able to share and use those tools, um, particularly with people who are currently living in residential aged care so that they can um, have the opportunity to have some impact. So the first uh, series of tools is a, a three-part podcast series. And this is um, titled A Conversation About Moving Out of the Nursing Home. 
And this is this lovely series of conversations between Sam and Karen, who are participants in this project, talking about their own experiences around moving out. It's quite a personal podcast series. And as you can see in the three parts listed there, you know, there's some sensitive topics that they talk about. So it's very real, it's very personal, um, and gives some really lovely insights into just some of the complexity around thinking about this move and then to make this move. There's also a four part video series where Helen, who has made this move out of residential aged care, um, she tells us that she kind of almost holds our hand through her experience of making this move. So there's four parts to this, focusing on the challenges and barriers to moving, looking at what supported you to move, coordinating my daily support and what life is like now. And again, this is a really accessible video series where we very much feel that um, Helen talks us through and um, we get to hear around some of the really kind of day-to-day -day needs that came out for Helen during this period of change. And the third resource is a three-part audio and written series. And this is very much focused on finding the right support for your move. So in this project, the participants talked a lot about not just kind of the emotions and the, the processes that were involved in making the move out of residential aged care to more individualised or independent housing, but the really importance of support. You know, we've heard Megan talk earlier today around getting support right. Well, here there is um, some really lovely resources around where to find support, who is in a support team and how to choose good support to assist people with this move out of residential aged care. Um, so they're really quite significant and practical resources that were developed from this project and which are currently being used. Um, and where all of us that were involved in this project are really proud of these tools that were produced. But I would like to also talk with you today, not just about the development of these tools and the co-design project, but this opportunity that we had to evaluate or to better understand the experience of participating in co-design. So at the beginning of the project, we were well aware that while we're talking a lot about co-design and we're seeing it in pockets of our practice, there's not a lot of information or guidance, um, particularly working with people with neurological disability and quite significant neurological disability around how to do co-design well. So we saw this as a great opportunity to both do this project, but then to evaluate the experience of participants. And we were really interested in understanding the enablers and barriers to participation in co-design and identifying potential benefits through this experience of participating in co-design. So we followed a qualitative constructive, constructivist grounded theory methodology and we invited all the participants in the co-design project to then participate in this uh, research evaluation and we sought ethics approval for this part of the work. Um, and nine people, six storytellers or people with lived experience of disability and three of the facilitators of the co-design project all uh, consented to participate in this project. And as you can see on the slide here, we conducted interviews after recruiting the participants, but before starting the design part of the co-design project. And then we again did follow up interviews with all the participants at the end of the project. And that's what I'd like to talk and share with you a little bit now is some of the lovely insights that we got both pre-participating in the co-design project and post around this experience of co-design. So in the interviews that we conducted before commencing the co-design project, we got some really lovely insights into hopes and expectations of co-design. And in many ways, doing these interviews actually set the scene for the co-design project. So some of the learning that we got through these initial interviews informed the way in which we worked in um, connecting the group together and conducting the, the co-design project and certainly tailoring the roles to the individual needs of all participants. And as you can see here, three main themes emerge from our analysis of these interview data. So there's embracing the opportunity of co-design, juggling hopes and fears, and learning about co-design. And I'm just going to share a few insights about each of those themes now. So with embracing the opportunity, um, 
one of the key learnings that came from this was around helping others. And I, and I certainly know from my PhD research around storytelling opportunities and, and people with lived experience of disability being able to share their experiences and stories with others. There's this really strong theme of motivating theme really of helping others through my own experience. Um, and again, that came out in this project. And I think Christine sums this up. I want everyone to have the same experience moving out of aged care. So Christine was so happy with the move for her that that was really what motivated her to apply for this role and to participate in this project to try and create opportunities for other people to take this move. There was also a really strong theme around employment um, and Gabby shares she was feeling really fortunate to be able to be part of this and to be working um, and I should acknowledge that we um, certainly viewed every participant in this project as um, working for the Summer Foundation and they were paid for their time. Um, and it was a really important part of that recruitment process to be able to recognise that contribution of, of everybody. And this other point around contributing in a new way was really interesting. So Deidre says, I think just in general, I feel that I can add to the project by coming up with ideas and problem solving. So all of the participants talked about the importance of sharing their own lived experience and having the opportunity to share their story, but they were also looking for this additional opportunity to move into problem solving and coming up with ideas and solutions. So moving just from sharing their story to actually generating solutions and doing this collaboratively with others. The second theme, juggling hopes and fears. So here we see um, similar a little bit to the, the earlier theme, this idea of wanting to contribute and to have impact. And Christine says, it will be fantastic to give my opinions and suggestions and have them listened to. Again, around this work theme, people talked about this, I'm just gonna see if I can do this work thing. I want to test out my work capacity in this project. As Deidre says, my main goal is to see whether or not I can do it. So I think this work really presented as a, a safe opportunity for people to be employed, but to just test out that capacity. Can they then apply for work outside of perhaps the familiarity and security of the Summer Foundation and their relationship with the Summer Foundation? There was also some really lovely reflections around building social connections. And again, being mindful that this project was conducted during COVID, um, Ingrid shared, she was looking forward to working with others who have a similar life to mine. So people said things like, oh, I'm really curious to see who I might meet. Um, there was a little bit of guardedness. Some people were, I'm not sure if I'm gonna make friends or make connections, but actually I would really like to if that opportunity came up through this project. And as I said before, there are a number of participants who did have communication difficulties or specific needs. Um, and Gabby did share, you know, I'm a bit worried about other people understanding me and my speech and communication. Um, and a few people also shared that they were concerned that their communication needs might impact negatively on the ability of others to share and contribute to the project. Um, so there was a really strong sense of how is my communication needs going to impact us working collaboratively in this project. And the third theme um, in these pre-project interviews was around learning about co-design. So people had some vague idea about co-design and there was a range of kind of knowledge and experience that people brought to the project. But when we asked a little bit more about it, um, people said things like, I just really like the opportunity to work with other people. So people understood that it was going to be collaborative and they were looking forward to that opportunity, weren't quite sure beyond that. Christine had a little bit more detail in her response to what co-design was about or what she was expecting the project to be about. Um, and she said, shared, as a concept, co-design sounds fantastic. It is a great movement on. When I have provided my lived experiences, it hasn't been about how services have operated, more about the travails of living in aged care. I haven't really looked at not so much a more positive thing. And I thought this was a really interesting reflection, although she was very happy to be sharing her own lived experience. There was this sense that this is often disclosing negative or challenging experiences that she'd had in her past, 
and she was quite looking forward to contributing to some positive solutions. So having more of a kind of a positive conversation and participating in that with the group. But I think like many of us here, there was some skepticism around, well, what is co-design and are we really going to be able to do this well? And I think this is a really important point. So Billy said, bringing skepticism about the co-design process. So Billy, Billy knew a bit more about co-design and knew that it can be really on a spectrum of involvement and was quite cautious around, you say you're going to be doing co-design, but am I really going to feel like my experiences are impacting and I'm involved in the design of these tools or am I going to feel a little bit on the periphery? So quite understandably, Billy brought some scepticism to this project as did a few other people, including the, the facilitators. So this wasn't just the, the people with lived experience disability, it was also the facilitators. So that, this slide here just gives us a little bit of an overview of these hopes and expectations that people brought to the co-design project. Um, and I'm mindful of time, but I think we're doing okay. So I'd like to now push forward to after the project where we interviewed people about their experience and, and we got some really lovely reflections about participating in co-design and what this experience was like. So the three themes that emerged from this analysis were making sense of co-design, being employed and contributing, and creating meaningful tools. And again, I'll just share some more detailed insights. So the first theme here is making sense of co-design. There was a really overwhelming sense from all participants about the building trusting and respectful relationships. And I think Deidre sums this up. I definitely felt involved. I felt that my voice was heard. It was really important that we did get this positive feedback. Um, however, it is important to acknowledge that this project, um, the, we all went into it with a really strong intent to achieve um, a sense of trust and comfort and really positive relationships. And so an enormous amount of time was invested in that development. So I am acknowledging that that didn't just happen easily and it wasn't a quick solution. Um, there was definitely a focus on building those relationships, but we certainly got some really positive feedback from participants about um, feeling connected with others. However, even at the end of the project, there was still a number of reflections around navigating the co-design experience, in particular around decision-making and facilitation. Um, so Frankie's reflection is, this is me making the decision, which is problematic, but I don't know how else to move things along. So from the perspective of a facilitator, it was tricky. At, there was this reflection that at key points in time, Frankie had to kind of step in and tie the pieces up a little bit in, to enable then the group to work and move forward. Um, and Billy shared... I guess reflected on some, some suggestions or solutions that may have made this, this better for, for future reference. So Billy shared coming up with an agreed process map with key timeframes and who is involved. Important to map out the project and this is when we are going to make this decision and there are the key decision making points. So there was a range of experiences but there was an overwhelming sense of the participants as a group wanting to be involved deeply in the project and in generating and designing the solutions, but also looking for some external facilitation around the roadmap of the co-design and who was going to be involved at which points in time and who would be making decisions at which point in time. Um, so I think that was a really important reflection around doing co-design well with this particular group of people. The second theme was around being employed and contributing. And we got some really lovely feedback around developing confidence and work capacity. So Deidre says, when I started the project, I was unsure of whether I could meet all the requests, but I discovered that I could. I would love to continue to be involved with casual work. I think I can manage it. Definitely gave me confidence. And again, I recognised that there was a lot of tailoring of roles and flexibility that was um, I guess, built into this project, but it was really um, lovely to see this, this development of confidence throughout the project and this sense that I could continue to work. There was a strong sense of belonging across participants um, and Deidre shared, being part of an organisation is important, paid and unpaid work, not just being a drain on the system. And I think what's important there is that some of the participants were paid 
as employees, and that was important to them. Others were given gift vouchers because that suited them better. So it is important that we give people a range of payment options, particularly when we're looking at casual work. Um, but I think more than payment here, what DG was talking about was actually making a valuable contribution and being part of a group that were contributing. And that's what was really valued. Um, and this idea of not being on the drain on the system, but actually contributing and using their lived experience to, to contribute. Um, but as the, the third point here around needing flexibility, there were a number of reflections around the speed of the project. So some participants still felt that it was too fast paced. And as Gabby said, I thought week to week, it was a bit too fast, to complete the tasks between meetings. And Ingrid reflected around having support and space for reflection, such as a mentor traveling with you through the project would have assisted. So Ingrid and a number of the other participants felt that in order to make sense of the learning and the process across the co-design, perhaps having a little buddy who kind of had some check-in moments and some opportunities to reflect and make sense of the learning might've helped them with coping with the, the speed of the project. And the last theme is around creating meaningful tools. Um, and there was a really strong feeling of pride amongst the group as Christine shares, I think the project is great and they are fantastic tools. A voice that is actually part of a whole that people have some part of together. Um, and really important to all of us that um, there was this strong sense of ownership of the tools. People were proud of their involvement in the development of these tools and proud to share these tools and recognise that it was a team effort. Um, and there was also this lovely recognition of valuing and showcasing lived experience of disability, as Deidre said, definitely showed through. People's opinions showed through on the final product. And I think that is a good thing. Um, and I think that is what is lovely about the three different resources. Is there is a different look and feel to each of those resources because different people were leading the development of those tools um, so it very much is grounded. Each of those tools are grounded in the lived experience of the people who develop them. So just as a as summary slide, these are the, the re reflections that we got around this co-design experience across the group participants. So I guess in kind of pulling together this lovely opportunity to not only do this project, but to evaluate, to try and better understand the co-design experience, there was a very strong sense that co-design enabled a strengths-based opportunity for participants to contribute meaningfully to the development of tools that they were proud of. Um, and I'm sure many of us today would be aware that in the literature, there are examples um, of co-design work or work involving consumers or people with lived experience where people haven't felt that it's been strengths-based, it's been disempowering rather than an empowering experience. Um, so it was really important um, for us to learn that in this project and the way in which this was conducted, um, there was a sense of empowerment and it was a strengths-based experience for the participants. Um, and important, I think, for us to understand that the co-design itself was very much grounded in storytelling or story sharing and problem-solving solutions. And the participants found the co-design project supported their own capacity building for their own ready, work readiness. So the project itself was about capacity building others, other people who are still living in residential aged care. But what we found is that the participants themselves also engaged in an enormous amount of capacity building around their own work readiness. But like everything, it's, it was far from, from perfect. And there were some um, really important learnings through this evaluation around um, co-design and what we took mostly from this project was the importance of role clarity. So although we are working as a team, there was a strong sense across all participants for the need for some level of facilitation and nominated facilitators, not to dominate the work program, but more just to hold the threads together. And, and certainly in the literature, we hear a lot about that if this facilitation approach is used, it's generally okay if people are explicit about that. So at the beginning of the project, everybody knows who their roles are um, and that there will be this level of facilitation at times. 
Um, also really important to think about the time structure and obviously a lot of the work that we do is ex for all of us beyond, I'm not talking just Summer Foundation here, but more generally for all of us either in research or practice, there are external limitations around time and funding. So um, we recognise that, but also recognise the importance of creating space and time to engage well with participants and to create space for learning, participation and making sense of the project as we progress along. And look, there is this potential need or, or value in having some supported reflection or a peer buddy that travels along the project. Certainly in this project, there was one facilitator who had both an allied health background and also had lived experience um, of disability. And she also felt quite strongly that that would be a role that she would love to provide that, that buddying support throughout the project. So we learned a lot, I think, around co-designing this particular group. And at the end of this project, which um, we were really keen to then look at more externally into the literature to see what others have found through co-designing. Um, and so we certainly had this intent to conduct a scoping literature review and we could see the potential, we can see the potential value of developing a framework for engaging people with neurological disability in co-design and, and how to do this well with this group of people. Um, and as you can see on this slide at the bottom, we've had our protocol for the scoping literature review published just recently, that's in BMJ Open, it's open access. So again, if you're interested, in looking at this work, please have a look at that protocol. Um, and we're at the, the tail end of um, this scoping literature review. So we look to publishing that in kind of early to mid next year and really hope that that's a, a valuable um, manuscript for, for many people who are interested in doing work in this space. And we're certainly looking forward to continuing to learn and to develop our, our approach to co-designing with people with lived experience of disability. So, I'm mindful of time. I'd like to thank you for listening and I hope that um, you've enjoyed today's presentation. And again, I'd really like to acknowledge the contributions of the many people who really contributed to this project and, and I'm just sharing the experiences here today. So thank you.